Welcome to this webinar. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker today, Professor Adams from McMaster University. He's a chemical engineer who received a dual bachelor's degrees from Michigan State University in 2003, one in chemical engineering and the other in computer science. He received his PhD in 2008 from the University of Pennsylvania under the supervision of Professor Cedar, and then went on to complete a postdoc with Professor Barton at MIT. His primary educational contributions concern undergraduate and graduate course development concerning flow sheet synthesis and simulation energy systems engineering and computer-aided chemical engineering tools. He recently published the book, Learn Aspen Plus in 24 Hours. He's also the creator of pscommunity.org, which hosts LAPS, the Living Archive for Process Systems Engineering, which is the leading digital repository for PSE education, journal article preprints, and research materials. It's my pleasure, especially today, to introduce Professor Adams as the award winner for the David Himmelblau Award for Innovations in Computer-Based Chemical Engineering Education that he received from the AICHE CAS community in late 2021. So with that, we'll go ahead and turn it now over to Professor Adams. All right, thank you so much for that introduction, and it's really great to be here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about something I've been very passionate about and uh, have been working on for the past decade in, in course development in this particular undergraduate course. And we do things a little differently here at McMaster, um, which is in Hamilton, Ontario in Canada, uh, for those who don't know. Um, and um, the course that I run is would be often considered a traditional design course, but we do it at the third year. Uh, which would be like junior year for you Americans. Um, and it's a little bit different, but I want to share how we do things. And I think there's a lot of interesting things um, that uh, some of you might want to be able to take away um, um, from everything. So uh, the basic overarching theme for today is really that process design and synthesis simulations, all that stuff is really the vessel by which you teach everything else, like communications and control, all the core competencies of your curriculum, critical thinking, and you can go through the whole list. But basically, um, all the core, the core concepts within chemical engineering are taught through design. Um, and if you have time, your design course can teach them how to design a process. I mean, that's really, you know, the main message is that there's so much more. It's not even really about the design it's more about teaching everything else in the curriculum. And I'm saying this as someone whose entire research career is built around process design. That's the most important thing to me. And yet when I teach it, that's actually one of the least important things in my course is the ability to actually design a high quality process. So that's the main theme for today. Um, you can download this talk in LAPS. This link will be at the bottom of every slide. So if you want the conference, um, the slides, and then although um, also, of course, this will be recorded on, on, on John's website. And of course, I have to plug the book, uh, Learn Asset Plus in 24 Hours, in which the, the award um, was based. And this is integrated in the course. And so um, here it is. It just came out last month. Um, so it's, it's decently sized, not too bad. 12 two-hour tutorials, uh, but we now have a bunch of uh, bonus materials. Um, that have like a lot more advanced things that the community asked for. So interesting things like using Python, parallel computing, optimization, even in parallel computing, hard stuff with CO2 capture and property packages. And this was developed with the input of really, you know, we had 700 grad and undergrads. Um, we've had professors at five different institutions. And this was developed um, with all of that input to either be for one course or you can spread it out vertically across your curriculum um, in many courses in many different years. So uh, that was really designed with the, the feedback and the needs of the, the education community in North America in particular. So uh, big picture about the course and, and teaching design and simulations, flow sheeting and all that sort of stuff. Um, is really understanding that design is as much of an art as it is engineering, right? So one of the one of the early good textbooks is the Art of Chemical Process Design by Rells and Roach. We have Rules of Thumb of Engineering Practice by Don Woods. So Don Woods is, uh, I basically hold his office. I was kind of hired to replace him when he retired, but he was very influential for me personally in my um, educational uh, development um, as an instructor and as, as a designer. And, you know, I would even argue that 
you can identify in some cases the artist of a design by looking at the flow sheet, the process, and you can see like the decisions made by that engineer and reflected, you know, the personnel reflecting those decisions in the design. And so the human component cannot be eliminated here. And that's very true in the teaching. You know, who is teaching it, what their skill sets are, and what are the objectives for your course and your program. Um, so, you know, at McMaster, we have a number of outcomes that uh, for our program, like our process design sequences, we're, we are very concerned with the fundamental understanding of design concepts. So we are a PSC focused department. And so for us, we are really interested in, you know, the latest technologies and methods um, and the, the critical thinking and adaptability that comes with it. But, you know, I'm, I would call a true expert in this field. Like this is my entire career in training and research expertise. Um, but a lot of courses are taught by someone, you know, could be a new professor that's never taught anything before and has only taken an undergrad course and that's it. Um, a lot of departments just hire out because they don't have anyone to, skilled in their department really in that area. Um, and so, you know, your own courses, you really have to design it around your situation. So I'm not someone who says this is the way you should do it. Uh, I'm more preaching like you have to think about what's best for your situation and then adapt as best as you can with what you have available to meet your own goals. And, 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 and that's, that's my overarching message. And, you know, I have data for Canada. So I took Canada's U15. So it's our top 15 research institutions. Collectively, they get a 3% or more of all of our funding. So this is really our major institutions. 14 of, our, of these 15 grant a chemical engineering degree in one way or another. Um, and so we uh, took a survey, um, well, I looked at the, the data on who teaches what, and uh, I was able to find 10 of these eight, 14 departments have what I would call active PSC research, research faculty. So this is someone doing research regularly in process systems engineering, and that could be the design, it could be controls or optimization modeling, um, what we consider PSC. And that's, it's about 70% have somebody. And so I would call those people highly qualified to teach this design course or a natural, natural choice to teach these courses. And about eight of them have someone who I'd call a design specialist like me. Um, so that's a little bit over half. And so I define that as someone whose research expertise would be in the design, the simulations or synthesis, modeling and simulation. So something in that um, very core competency. And Canada is very active in PSC compared to the US. Um, I don't have, the best data I can find for the US is about 50% would be in this category. And that's that's just heuristical, it's not really good data. Um, but within Canada, uh, we have almost three faculty in PSC per department of this U15, um, I guess the 14. Um, uh, but if you have PSC at all, it's almost four on average. So if you're a department that has anyone that does active research in the field, you tend to have three other colleagues with you in that same field. So we're a very PSC centric uh, country to be quite honest in our department as well, we have five and um, it's almost a third of our whole faculty is PSC specifically. So we're a very PSC focused place. Um, and that's gonna really affect our curriculum, which will be very different than a lot of other situations. So um, our overall curriculum, and it's important to understand the course in the context of the curriculum. Um, but one of the things that we've do done is uh, over the past three or four years, we've completely revamped our entire curriculum to have a mathematical modeling focus. And this is spearheaded by Professor Jake Neese. He is our teaching expert. Um, and so he's sort of revamped how we teach and the structure of our courses. And one of the things that we did was we started moving numerical methods and mathematical modeling as its own course in second year. So while they're taking the first term, it's the first year we see them, they have a general first year, but while they're doing mass and energy balances, they're modeling like a tank or modeling a heat exchanger and then solving it dynamically. Uh, you know, learning ODE integration, that kind of thing. So from, this, from the get-go, they're using modeling and then that way, as we do more mass and energy balances, the thermo fluid separations, all that stuff, they're building models and solving them numerically throughout the whole curriculum. We even get to statistics and latent variable methods. Um, so then by the time they get to me at the second term of our third year, they have done modeling and they've done uh, in, integrated with all of their basics. So the idea of modeling 
is already built in. They haven't done a lot of Aspen. They do a little bit of the, um, a few chapters from the book leading up to it in individual courses, but they haven't actually like done Aspen training um, or really flow sheet modeling. They've just done little equation-based models that they can do in MATLAB. Um, but this is our third year, and this would be the course that most people do in their fourth year. Um, so then fourth year, they have all their advanced separations. They have the controls, the second controls course. Um, we have energy systems courses, and then we have our second design course, which is really about economics and operability and safety. And then their final term, we have optimization. They can do like machine learning stuff if they want. And then the true process design course um, at the end, but by but every, all the major training happens a here and it's really just a big project at that point. Um, and so one of the main uh, one of the main sort of ethos changes is we're trying to avoid what I would call the green engineering paper solutions, right? So giving equations and, and problems that are sort of manufactured with just the right assumptions and just the right um, you know pieces of information so that you can work all the equations and move things around so you get a, like an exact analytical solution and you kind of close the box at the end of the at the end of your your green piece of paper. So we're moving away from that and we're trying to do things that are a little bit more complex where okay, I can write the model, I can express the theory, but I'm not going to worry about trying to make things fit so they have a nice clean analytical solution. We're really more about doing the solver based the algorithmic solutions and sort of you know, so you, you, you still capture that complexity, um, but giving them the tools to solve it. Um, and so that opens up the door for us to doing harder things. So, you know, we put an optimization right into my, uh, my conceptual flow sheet course by the time they get to me. So they start learning, you know, how to optimize a flow sheet because they can do numerical methods and they can understand real basics. It doesn't mean they need to learn linear programming even or duality theory and any of that stuff. All they need to know is that I could guess some numbers and then I could check an objective function and I could just keep guessing until I find a better number. And then they can kind of automate that with just like solve or an Excel or something. Um, so we, we bring that whole thinking into this level. Uh, so it's very open-ended um, and, and it's built around mathematical modeling and, and designing the problem. So that's my course. And this one, we have life cycle analysis built in. We have superstructure optimization built in. Again, these are all simple versions of these things, but we're able to have this kind of level because we've developed um, our program to do that. So when they get to our second design course, we focus on the economics, safety, operability, troubleshooting, um, scheduling. Uh, they do superstructure optimization more and flexibility. So we can have some advanced flow things, but you know, in my course, I don't worry about the cash flow. They can compute a cost by just multiplying like, you know, a flow rate times the price or something. Um, and we worry about all those cash flow details later. And then in the final design course is when they have like their project and the project fits a particular theme based on their specialty and their program. And that's with when we have industrial mentors and that kind of thing. Um, but at this point they have all the tools to do it. And they just need to do like a big project, basically. Um, so at this point, they have all the training to advance things. And one of the one of the feedback is they find it very easy. Um, it's too easy. They thought it was going to be harder because we basically taught them all these hard techniques. And then they only use like a little bit of it for their project. And like, oh, I guess I didn't need everything I learned. But that's reality. You don't need you don't know what you're going to need to get to the problem. Um, but they end up coming with the high quality designs. We focus on quality in this, in this particular course. So my course, again, is this third year, second term course that we tend to teach, um, I think would be a normal design course uh, across the world normally. Um, so here's a great example of how the same kind of thinking can be changed, like uh, can apply at really any stage of education. So Here's, here's a couple example questions that are design questions. Um, you know, which, which, which design option is the better way of changing a gas pressure in these cases? So let's say I wanna go up in pressure, I have steam at some weak pressure and I wanna increase the pressure. Maybe I can use a compressor, compressor sequence or something to get there. Or maybe I should condense that steam to water, pump it and then reheat it and reboil that. Um, or maybe I want to go down, maybe I want to use a flash drum to go down in pressure with some gas, or I can use a turbine. And so you can ask this question at any level and, you know, depending on what 
you want them to think about, there's a lot of ways to solve this problem. Like I might just use heuristics or engineering wisdom. So, or in Cedar's textbook, for example, is a whole chapter in just design his heuristics and wisdom. And, you know, the wisdom and heuristics would tell you very clearly that this second option is better in this case. And this, this option would be based on size, really, how much work you can produce in that turbine. That's a heuristic. And that's fine. And there's, there's an art to it. And there's a value to that. You might say, mm, maybe we should use some kind of first principles model, something simple that we can write down and solve by hand. So maybe they could do the ideal gas law and understand, maybe I can get some work out of it. How much work would I get? What would these conditions be? Um, or use a, you know, a pressure enthalpy diagram or something. Um, or you could say, well, well, let's solve this problem with something rigorous. Like let's use some data-driven or first principles modeling. So something harder that I might use a computer software to do, like I might model these in Aspen Plus. Um, or you could be very advanced and you might say, you know what, we're gonna do these things inside of some rigorous eco-technoeconomic optimization framework, considering the context of the balance of plant, and we're gonna use life cycle analysis and capital costs and have all these like this really complicated, um, you know, level. And so this same question can be addressed at like basically any year of your education. And so that's my point is that you can still have flow shooting, you can still have design and have all of these key concepts at every level um, of your education. So it really depends on what do you want in your course and what's really important to you. So I think like the most important things universally are going to be, you know, the real value of this course is not the course, it's everything else that you taught in your curriculum. It's understanding how do you link thermo, mass transfer, heat transfer, unit ops, separations, reactions, control, like all this stuff. How do you link them all into one piece? How does everything work together? And then all the other aspects about uh, the students need to take ownership of that knowledge. So can I write the equations down? Can I formulate a problem? Can I make a decision like the design decision? Like, do I have equipment A or equipment B? Um, and then how does that relate to life? And I think these are the most important concepts, whereas actually being able to design a high quality process might be a lot lower in priority. Um, and, I, and it's true in my course, like for my third year course, the quality is all terrible. I mean, I don't want to say that um, they learn an awful lot. But like if I judged it on like true, like optimal quality, um, you know, that covers every aspect, like they're not ready yet. They're not ready for that, but I can, they can have an extremely good, well thought out design that factors in everything that they've learned and then come away from this a far better chemical engineer than they were before they started. And that's really my goal by doing this in third year. Okay, and then they can go back and then we focus on quality in that final term of the fourth year. Um, so I just wanna just show you a little bit about my course structure. I don't think it's gonna be that different from a lot of yours. Um, it's roughly a quarter in each area of focus. We have classic lectures. In our case, we have a lot of challenge questions. I'll get into those. We have a lot of noise. That's a, if you, any of you knew Don Woods was, he's a, he loves noisy classrooms and I definitely learned a lot from his pedagogy. Um, our tutorials are like Learning Aspen Plus, that's the book. Um, course project inter integrates the entire thing. It really drives the whole course uh, through groups and then our midterms and our finals, basically. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. And it doesn't mean that's how you should do it because you need to find a system that works for your personality, it works for your curriculum, your students. Um, and so this is how I do it and I think it's valuable and I've changed it a lot over the years. And um, that's just the nature of teaching. Like, you got to find what works best for you. So I don't want to say that like my way is the best way. And I don't think that's true. Um, now, I want to mention flipping the classroom. This has been a hot topic here for a long time. Our deans pushed it very hard, um, former dean. And I was very resistant. I just thought this is not something I wanted to do. I didn't think the students wanted to do it. But during the pandemic, my traditional online teaching was just no one showed up like they if they did show up, they didn't participate. I couldn't get them to answer a question. I'm lecturing to a bunch of, you know, people initials on little black windows because no one turned the cameras on and the participation rate really stunk. So eventually I switched to a flipping the classroom approach during the pandemic and I had a great time. I loved it. Students were super engaged. Um, but there's a big question. So last week we went back finally in the pandemic. I'm finally back in the classroom uh, with actual students in it. And so I took a survey and we wanted to say, OK, do you want to keep going with the flip classroom format um, where you're going to watch the videos ahead of time and then participate in the during normal lectures? 
And this survey is from basically this ended last night. So this is hot off the presses. Um, and basically no one wanted to do it. So you look at this 10% wanted to keep doing flipping the classroom and everyone else either didn't care or, you know, strongly even disagree. This is, this, and this, this is a different question, different time, but I prefer professor gives a lecture format and you can see it was significantly um, in agreement. And so I'm not going to do it. And so for those of you on the debate, you know, this might work great for you, but the students are very clear in their feedback. I have lots of written feedback that like they recognize the value, but the time requirement was just too much. And our program in third year is really dense, like incredibly difficult this term. So for us, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think the students have really said that. So I'm back to my lecture style where I do, you know, content driven lectures, but we have a lot of challenge questions. And this is a, this is a good example of one. Um, you know, in this particular, what I do is, you know, every maybe 10 minutes, we will have a question like this to review things we talked about or to introduce the next topic. And the point of this is, it's really not the question, it's it's the engagement with the students. So in this particular question, I just have a picture of a reactor, some reaction, and I'm saying, you know what, this reactor is exothermic and adiabatic. So which of these statements is true? Both of these streams have the same enthalpy. What Stream one is the higher enthalpy, two has the higher enthalpy, or you don't know. And then I say, okay, talk about it with your neighbor, go. And so then you know, I'll say like noise level up. That was a good Don Wood statement. So then people start talking around them and they try to argue as it A as it B and they talk about it. And then I go around the room and sometimes I'll have the TAs will be there too. So the TAs will go around the room and we'll talk with the students and we'll say, okay, well, what do you think? You think it's A, well, what do you think? Okay, you think it's B. Why do you think it's B? All right, what do you think about what that, what that person said? Okay, so uh, you have this engagement and then you, you cut it and you say, okay, everyone raise your hand if you think it's A, raise your hand if you think it's B, that kind of thing, All right? Or you can use eye clickers and that kind of technology some people prefer. Um, and then if you have a good question like this, they won't all have the same. If they all have the same, great, you move on. But a question like this is, you know, the answer is A, but uh, a lot of people might say, well, stream one has higher enthalpy because it's exothermic, so it lost energy because of the reaction. Or people, a lot of people say C, because uh, the enthalpy goes up because the temperature is higher. Like neither of those are true, but that's what they think. So uh, very often this question, I'll get thirds. And so then I'll say, okay, someone from stream, uh, from, from choice A, def like can you tell me why? Defend it, like tell me why. Okay, now someone from B, you do it. And then we go back again and then, okay, based on what you heard, then they, then they, they talk about it again. And then a lot of times the second or maybe even third, uh, they'll, they'll agree on a consensus. So it's a wonderful experience because they have this big engagement and then we go back to the lecture and then they're prepared to focus again for another 10 minutes. Um, so that's a big, a big focus. The other, the other big focus is around the book is in the tutorials. So this is specifically around Aspen Plus and what we do is each chapter is a two hour tutorial. Any person can just pick it up and do it, but the, the, the individual chapters are designed really not to teach you clicking buttons and like they're not a user guide to the software. It's really designed so that the students kind of move into little problems. And they kind of experience oh, a little hiccup here and there and they have to start thinking about how they're going to solve this problem. And as the book goes on, it's less about um, push the, this is what the button does. It's a lot more about, okay, now tr we're going to try to integrate some things to so try to use these tools to solve the problem. And so it's really meant for the instructors and the TAs to engage with the students while they're using the book. And so I train my TAs in engagement style. And this, you can, we can do that for the experiential learning of things in the classroom. We do this for talking about them with their projects and we do this with um, the tutorials. The key thing here, uh, we use a hierarchy of understanding, okay? Is we wanna understand when a student has a problem, where are they on this knowledge level hierarchy? All right. So, um, and the goal is that we want to ask enough questions and get them to the next level of the hierarchy and then move on. So you don't stay with one student for too long. So like at level one, they're totally unprepared for the material. So they just, they just don't know what's going on. They didn't read the material ahead of time. The, the dealing with this might just be, well, you should read the prerequisite section or watch the videos. So we have videos linked to, um, you know, before every tutorial, right? And then, you know, we'll come back and help you when you're, if you still, if you still need, uh, don't understand. You know, maybe you don't understand the problem. Um, so the next level is, okay, I, I'm prepared. I, I can at least start, but I don't really know how to, what the problem is even asking me to do, like what I'm supposed to do. Um, and we can ask very specific things. 
Um, we can try to explain it. We can try to say, well, we're talking about this kind of solution or a simple version of the problem. So without going into details, we have training in how to deal with that situation. Maybe they understand the problem. They can formulate the problem, um, but they don't understand how to solve it. So that's a great one for conversation. Like what, what have you tried or what have you thought about trying or what do you think might not work? Um, and so, or what was the question, correct answer might look like? Are you asking for a temperature and what range would that temperature would be, for example? So the point is to get them to the point when they can get started on the solution. The next one is they're missing parts of that strategy. So you can focus on the knowledge gaps. And then the last stage is I just have some small missing pieces like, oh, this is the function you want. Something very small where the understanding is they are just a little piece of data, right? So we want to work them through this hierarchy. And so that works at um, any engagement scenario within the course, whether it's the project um, or the, the, um, the tutorials are engaged. Um, something else we've been doing with exams and assessment, this has been radically transformed as well. Um, when it comes to Aspen Plus um, assessment specifically, what we do is we have like a, a two hour lab test in the lab or we've, we've been doing a take home um, with like a day, 24 hours uh, during the pandemic. Um, but what we do is we recognize that a student, like Aspen Plus is in a great framework for doing like a partial credit actually, because you miss, we make one block wrong and everything's wrong if you're looking at just uh, numbers. So what we do instead is we allow the students to choose questions that are inside of a tier. So we have five questions that are tier one through five and you get points based on the highest tier that you complete. So if I do tier four and I get it right, I get 40 points, even if I got the tier five question wrong. And I don't even have to do the earlier tiers. And there's not enough time to do every question. So you just jump right into the level that you think you're ready for. Um, and that, and there's time to do maybe three at total. So you, you might jump into three and try to work your way up to five. Um, or maybe you're not a, such a good student, you jump into one and see how far you can go. And then we can coach them ahead of time of like making that decision. And um, just skipping that, but just a good example, um, you know, tier one is like, find the outputs of using a pump. Like, can you like put a pump in the flow sheet, type some numbers in and hit run? Like that's a really basic thing, but that's only worth, you know, 20%. Um, and, you know, maybe tier two is something a little bit more complicated. Tier three, it might be design a distillation column. Tier four is like, okay, we're gonna do that, but now we're gonna do this with heating and cooling and utilities and some kind of integration. And tier four might be literally an economic optimization using the optimizer tool, utility costs, and even capital costs, depending on, on the complexity. Um, and so like you can see the level of knowledge as you go. And this kind of structure lets you start here and build on that um, down the line. So um, this has worked out very well. And this is a great way to test in that constrained environment um, for Aspen specifically. When it comes to our exam structure for the midterms, we have two other midterms and a final exam. Now we've switched entirely to an oral exam format and we started doing this in the pandemic and we're gonna keep this permanently. Um, basically each student, well, the students will be given three questions uh, about four days before the exam and they have to submit their answers the night before the exam day. And then on the exam day, the students meet with the three instructors. So me and we'll have two TAs and we each have one question and they have six minutes, really it's five minutes plus a transfer time for each question with each person. So they just move, we have just a schedule and they just move from person to person. And basically they defend their answers. So I can see their written answers and they just have to explain them to me. And that the students really like it. I think um, from my perspective, I really enjoy it because we really like to do open-ended questions. So like what I had in my question, they had us their exam on Friday, was design a process that effectively handleizes some waste stream. So I give them a waste stream at the design a process that does something with it. It could be combust for heat, make power, turn it into chemical, whatever. And they just really like the, the creativity that comes with it. And they like to be able to explain their thought process to me. And I could ask them in the middle, like, why did you make that decision? And they can tell me, and they like to communicate that with me. Um, and it's, they also get immediate feedback. They know their grades and they know exactly what they did wrong. And we'll all, very often they'll schedule a follow-up meeting 
to, to learn more from it. But this is very popular. This is the, the assessment from, so this is a survey from yesterday on, on last week's exam. And it looks just like all the other surveys we've had. You know, on midterm one, I believe I learned more or otherwise had better learning outcomes by participating in the oral exam format than if it were a take home exam. And uh, just three students disagree, so 5%. And everyone else is either neutral or agreed that their learning outcomes and their learning experience is better in this format. And they said that, okay, for the next midterm, you know, I was going to do a written exam because we're back in the classroom finally, but they want to do oral exams again. Okay, less than 10% disagree. And so actually our, our department now, five or six of our courses are now moving to, have now moved already to the oral exams. And this, this data I've collected over and over and over again in all my other courses since the pandemic. So this is radically transforming how we do things. It also helps with cheating too, because they're open-ended questions. So people come up with, are less likely to um, cheat, to be honest, because it's too easy to spot. Um, I think for the project, I, I'll skip it. I think it's gonna look a lot like most projects. I think. The, the main thing is we have a guided set of milestones and we have a TA dedicated to just mentorship. So they meet with this a particular TA every week on their projects in their groups. Um, and I, they do an hour oral defense. It's not a presentation and we don't bother with the written report. Like I can't get them, their, their writing skills are so terrible, I've given up. So they write a one page summary and a stack of tables and figures. And then they meet in my office and we just talk and we go over it. Um, and this is a wonderful learning experience that prepares them for the final because they know exactly all the different issues and they talk about what they've learned and it's like the best debrief you can ever have um, with a student and I think it's one of the biggest take home um, benefits. I think um, I'm almost done but I do want to mention because I have the audience I have a very particular uh, thing I'd like to encourage on distillation design and this is because I find I have to unteach a lot and I find um, we have a way of teaching distillation which is so like culturally, we've been doing it for like a hundred years almost. Um, and I wanna bring out the McCabe Thiele, uh, the McCabe Thiele method, right? So you took this diagram and a lot of you are like, oh yeah, I remember this, right? And if you think back to when you were a student and a lot of people say, oh yeah, I remember stepping off the stages. Like you get out the paper and your ruler and you draw the lines and then you can like draw the steps and you're like, okay, but then if you ask yourself, did I learn how to design a column? Did I learn the principles? Like what else do I remember about this? Do I remember how to draw the lines or why? And like what lines are what? And I think most people would say, if they're honest, they did not really remember any of this. And they just kind of like, oh yeah. Like that's the response when you show this kind of diagram. Like, yeah, I remember doing that. I'm never doing that again, right? And I think I think we lose a lot. I think, um, I think that you know, I advocate for a complete end to this method universally, like no more McCabe Thiele at all. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful 1940s technology and is a great advancement for doing something very complicated before a computer. But again, in the ethos of our department, we're looking more about mathematical modeling. So can you write fundamentals like mass and energy balances and vapor liquid equilibria? And then we'll let use numerical methods to solve them and keep them, keep the complexity there without having to reduce things to ideality all the time. Um, and if you go back to this method, you're deriving very strange equations that only apply in one circumstance. The nature of these lines aren't really connected to the parameters you care about in your column. And it's very slow. So, and it doesn't even connect to the technology itself. Like it's very hard to like, look at this and actually really understand what these lines mean. So we do really just a vapor liquid equilibria and mass balance, mass energy balance model approach. And, you know, you can connect it to a VLE diagram, like a TXY diagram, like I can see you know, the tie lines on a stage so they understand what flashing is. I can tell that, you know, this might be the average mole fraction um, of the whole mixture. Um, and that's because I have, you know, liquid coming down at this mole fraction mixing with this one going down. So I know I'm somewhere in between, right? So stage six coming down, vapor eight coming up to stage seven. So I know that I'm gonna be somewhere in between here for my total mixture. And my energy is also similarly, I have something hot coming up, something cold coming down. So maybe somewhere in between. So you can, they can conceptually kind of link what's going on in these tie lines. Um, but, and, and so we try to teach it on this basis. And that also means we have to change like how we teach to like design and troubleshoot these columns. So and this is this is this legacy uh, of McCabe Thiele and, and Mr. Method and all those things are built right into Aspen. Like you type in number of stages and you type in the feed stage. And so if you're trying to play with a column, like, oh, do I need some more stages? Uh, do I have enough purity, whatever? 
you know, this legacy thinking and what's happening is we're teaching students to have a really nonsensical approach. If you think about like a relative gain array, if I increase my number of stages, that increases the number of stages really below the feed. So that'll improve the um, bottom's uh, purity. But if I change the feed stage by moving it down, by increasing that number, I improve the distillate because I have more stages above it, but I actually go down in the bottoms. So I actually affect both parameters with one variable. And it's a terrible way to think about it. Like try to do process control with that. It makes much set better to teach trays above the feed, trays below the feed, where you have a, a much more sensible approach where each thing affects things once. And we don't do that because in large part, Aspen doesn't take the numbers that way. And we're just not used to it. But if we just change our thinking a little bit, it suddenly makes so much more sense. You know, and so then we can teach things like, okay, we have the computing power. Let's look at what's inside the column instead. You know, I can look at mole fraction profiles, uh, trajectories inside my column. So here's a methanol water example. This is the bottom of the column. This is the top. And I can, I, I, you can teach to diagnose what's happening inside of a column from these curves. Like I can look here, I can identify that, okay, must have a feed stage here because I have a sudden shift in property. So that becomes very clear in my column sections in this binary distillation example. And I can see, okay, if, if, if these are curving, if there's a slope here, these stages are doing things. Like each stage is getting me closer to my goal and it kind of tapers off. But on this side, I can see, you know what? I have all these stages where nothing is happening, right? So I have all these stages doing nothing. And I can also see, I have a lot of change here. Uh, you know, so something is happening, but clearly adding more stages isn't gonna help me. So if I wanna have my purity go higher, I can do my other tool, which is either I can change the reboil ratio to go up at the bottom or I can change reflux to go up at the top. So you can teach very easily. All right, I'm gonna increase my reboil ratio and I can get to a higher one. And we can just look at these plots in real time as we make the changes. Um, and then I can say, okay, this reboil ratio really helped me get here, but I have all these extra stages. So I can just get rid of them. I have too many stages below the feed. And you can even count just by looking one, two, three, four. Okay, I can count the number of stages and just, just cut them. It's about 12 there. Then I run that again, I just cut them and then, okay, now I have you know a pretty good profile. I'm using all my stages have a purpose, and then you can let a design spec or optimizer hit your very specific targets. In this case, I want 97% in both, and I can change reflux ratio here, reboil ratio for that one, and then I end up within bada boom bada bing, like 25 seconds. I got an extremely well designed column that I can just look and diagnose that. Um, and so for an undergrad, this makes a lot more sense because I'm looking at the insides and I'm making decisions based on what's going on. So that's the kind of way I would really encourage we start thinking more, um, much, much more beyond the McCabe Feely. So that was just my curmudgeonly, my point. My overall final thought is, you know, this can be taught at any level of the curriculum because, you know, you're, you're really just, your really goal is to get everything in your education together and, and have everything integrated. That's what makes it hard. Um, you know, maybe great designs are not as important as all those other properties about getting good quality students out into the world. Um, and they really enjoy the creativity, uh, but it's so hard because they have to master their other materials. So I argue that you can really do this at any time. Um, and so third year is working, working very, very well for us. Okay, I'll thank you all very much. Um, and I will talk, uh, any, ask any questions from there. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you, Professor Adams. That was, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, we're going to open it up now for some questions and comments. Uh, we had one comment here in the chat window. I think your, um, you know, McCabe Teeley attack <laughs> is getting, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is getting a little bit of pushback. Uh, you know, that it might be valuable just to understand, you know, visually the separation of the, you know, of thermodynamic equilibrium stages. Uh, a really good comment here by Robert uh, Young, mostly agree with the distillation co design comments. I openly tell my students that nobody has done real distillation design by McCabe Teeley since before I was born a long time ago. <laughs> However, yeah, okay. I think I tell them that it is one conceptual way to understand the separation problem. Then I teach them how to design and consider the operations from the simulations. Is that Robert, I think I'm going to agree with you like 99 and a half percent. Um, because there's app, like you want to show the history and the, the progression of thought. Like I'm teaching fugacity today and you have to talk about 19th century like technology to do that. Um, like why does it exist? 
Um, so, you know, I really love the fact that you just tell them like, no one uses this. Um, and then you go with a better method. And I guess the only thing I would, I would have to say is if you're going to teach them something that nobody uses, is that something we want to teach? Like, that's just a bigger existential question. And what I do not have, Robert, and I would love to get is data on student outcomes if they've been taught McCabe Thiele or not taught McCabe Thiele, because we're talking about personal opinions and, um, and, and uh, things. So I have no data to tell you, because all of our students are taught McCabe Thiele in the year before they get to me. And I don't, I feel like it's more confusing than helpful, but I have no data. So Robert, I have to agree with you pretty much the whole way. And I would just love to show my, my curmudgeonly point that we should probably be looking at this issue. 100% agree. Um, but they've taken separations and, and have, have had to do a lot of McCabe Thiele diagrams. Um, and, and then I get them in computer aided process design and, and I tell them that's, that's all good and fine. And it's a great way to think about problems, but, but let's, let's learn something better. I, I mean, Robert, do you really want to do that? Would you rather that they just didn't bother with that? You don't have to unteach them? I, I haven't convinced the person teaching separation. <laughs> this, is, this is a message to the whole community. I think, I think you and I are on the same page then, Robert, 100% at this point. <laughs> okay, yes. fantastic. Well, we have another comment here uh, from Matthew Liberatore. Uh, I believe you are doing a workshop this summer at ASEE, ASEHE Summer School for Chemical Engineering Faculty. Can you tell us what you are planning for the workshop? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'm doing this with Mario Eden. Uh, I think Mario's on. I'm not sure if he dropped off. Yep. I can't see who's on right now from my screen. Um, I'm here, but, pal. Oh, great, Mario. And you can, you can hop in if you have anything you want to answer as well. Um, but Mario and I, we haven't finished all the details, but it's really focused around the tutorial aspect of it. So like in the workshop, you'll have the opportunity to do some of the tutorials from the book. Like you'll get, uh, have some couple there and you can pick one uh, and you get a sense of like, you know, what's, what's, what your needs are, how they work. And then we also talk a lot about the engagement issue. So like, how do you work um, with the students during this? How do you train the students? And then we talk more about the assessment. So like, how are you going to assess the material in your course. Um, and we also will talk about how to integrate it because the book, like I use the book for like my course, like they just do the chapters, not quite in order, but a lot of other programs and the people that have given feedback, um, these chapters are designed to be done vertically. So like certain chapters in second year, certain chapters in third year. So we kind of go over the, the curriculum structure around that as well. I think those are our main focuses. I don't know, Mar, if you have anything else you want to add. Um, just a, maybe a, a, a slight nuance to it is that the um, when we first did the workshop at the last summer school was when pa Tom had just published the first edition of the book. <clears throat> and this was not intended, neither is the one this year for Aspen experts. The whole idea is to provide folks that maybe are worried about being asked to teach something like this in the future, or maybe they've been thrown into it. They don't have you know, they don't spend their entire time working in the process systems engineering uh, field and, and all that. And we wanted to really get across that there are tools and, you know, material out there that will get you started, that is well packaged and is readily available, and that it's less scary because, as Tom said, and I thought made a wonderful point here, one of the key things when you're teaching simulation or design is really building confidence in the stuff they should already have learned. And so being able to tie that together, and in this case, focus it on a, on a computer package or software package. Um, if you're not used to doing simulation, that can be very scary, but you know our community knows that the simulator is only as good as the person you know, setting it up. And so you have to be a really good engineer to use a package like Aspen or any of the others as well. And so the computer doesn't, substitute your ability to to do critical thinking and so i think it's really meant to alleviate that concern but the nice thing is it covers such a broad range of material that it's helpful for a complete novice and an expert and so i think that's that's a uh, you know one aspect of the workshop that i think is why it was so well received the first time and 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 why we submitted um a second time so anyway that's all i would add tom fantastic that's great, mario thank you 
And, and thanks to Matthew for pointing that out. Uh, I'm going to be there at ASE uh, Summer School as well. Look forward to you know, pop in and take that uh, section, that course from Tom and Mario. So excellent. Um, okay, so just a, a couple questions about some of the conceptual questions, uh, the conceptual questions that you had there as well. Um, there's uh, a couple of different initiatives. You know, broader initiatives like the AICHE concept warehouse, uh, you know, Milo Koreski and, and John Falconer. How do you, are, have you put these onto that AICHE concept warehouse? Uh, uh, you actually, I've somebody? used it. So I've kind of gone the other direction. Um, so I have used the, some of those questions. And a lot of times I don't take them verbatim, but they give me a lot of great ideas. Like I'll twist it up right for my own particular need. Mm. Um, but no, I haven't put anything on there, but I definitely have taken from there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I know that I've used that one as well. I love your questions and thought provoking, you know, just these things that expose misunderstandings and, and a way to encourage active learning within the classroom. So uh, this is fantastic. And, and, you know, I'd, I'd say, do you have a way to share these also with the community? Um, I do. I think I have all of my prior course notes on labs. I can't remember if I did it for this course or just the energy course, but um, there's a good chance I'll be releasing all the course materials to the public uh, through labs. So I have to, Work that through some copyright things with the book, uh, but that's that's a possibility. Um, but I have no problem in giving my materials privately one to one. That's just on a request. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. We got. Uh, I've got uh, at least one or two more questions myself. But uh, let me just open it up to the audience. Um, let's see. Any other? I have Michael. Uh, I have a couple of comments and questions. So, uh, with regards to McCabe Thiele. So first of all, my name is Michael Karakoskis. I teach process simulation at uh, UIC. I follow a completely different approach than you, Tom. Um, but I have a couple of comments about the McCabe Filler diagram. I, was, I had the same opinion as you until I started teaching azeotropic distillation and trying to design columns to break an azeotrope. Then the McCabe filler diagram is of great help because students and engineers alike sometimes they have no clue where the azeotrope goes. If it goes to the bottom of the column or to the top of the column, and how are you going to design the set column? So, uh, so I used it last semester when I taught process simulation, doing azeotropic column distillation, and it helped a lot for the students to understand how to break the azeotrope. The other thing that the McCabe filler diagram helps you is to understand, you know, the thermodynamic uh, state of the feed. If it comes as a, as a saturated liquid, if it has, um, let's say, a certain fraction. I mean, you, traditionally, engineers that will send a saturated liquid, maybe with 1% vapor. And uh, so they, the slope of the line there, it helps you understand, you know, how the column is going to perform. So that's the comment that I have, you know. Uh, I agree with you on the flipped classroom, uh, but I think it's a horrible idea. And um, <laughs> I tend to believe is that the people who do it, are, they just simply don't want to teach, you know. And uh, so I completely, I co in fact, my students, they tell me that the professors who do that are lazy. <laughs> So uh, I completely agree with you on that. I, I tried it once, um, and it just was just a disaster, you know. So uh, so I, I I do exactly what you do. Uh, so these are my comments, and um, uh, the only thing that I want to ask is that do you guys so at UIC the simulation class is optional, and so. Not all the students who do the process design take simulation with me. And that creates an enormous problem because what some of them, when they do their design, it's just like they're clueless what to do. I mean, uh, they don't know how to design uh, a column or... Um, so if you're at, at McMaster, the simulation class is mandatory. Yeah, absolutely. So the it course itself... I wish it was like this at UIC, but I'm just, I'm really stuck with this option. 
Yeah, that sounds terrible to me, to be honest. I don't know how I would design without simulation. Like they go hand in hand. Yeah, I know. Um, so yeah, so there is required, but the simulation is actually just the tutorials because the course itself is around really conceptual design. Um, and so they, the tutorial, I don't even talk about Aspen in the lectures for the very, very yeah. little. Um, so yeah, for that sense, like, yes, it's, it's, it is a core course. Um, and it's so actually a, your presentation. You didn't say anything about physical properties. I spent quite a bit of time on physical properties because I mean, I mean, there's students that are taking alcohols to do a simulation and they use the Peng Robinson equation of stay at low pressures and they just don't think about it, you know, and then you get some weird results. You can do a, a you can do a, a perfect separation of water from ethanol if you use, you know, ideal <laughs> properties and you cannot predict the easier drop. So I spent quite a bit of time on that. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, I have the best answers for you that, okay, first of all, Chap bonus chapter four in my book, how to choose the oh, right physical I, I properties. Have book, I have okay, book. I can't see it. I, I don't I don't have it on the screen, but uh, it shows you like, okay, you have to check, get VLE data from Aspen Properties <laughs> Database. Make models. Here's one with an azeotrope. Like, look, the ideal model really stinks. I'm sure, yeah, you can separate it great, but it doesn't match the data. So how do you do like a statistical or graphical method to pick the right property model? So we have a huge focus. Chapter two and the bonus four is very in depth. So that's a major component. They have to choose their property model and validate it in all of my courses, no question. Um, no. As far as azeotropic distillation goes without vacated Thiele, we have that chapter two in the book shows you exactly how to use vape TXY diagrams and to design around the pinch point on the actual VLE diagram itself right, um, right. on page 18. You can't quite see it, but here's our VLE of three oh, different I know, pressures. I've seen, I've seen, yeah, I've on there. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Michael, but, you're preaching uh, the choir. <laughs> I, I wish someday we have some time to show you my philosophy on designing distillation columns. I mean, it basically comes also from my industrial experience at DOP. Yeah. You know, and uh, pr primarily the key factor is the pressure. And students don't know how to select the pressure in the tower. And uh, if you don't know how to do that, of course, you cannot do design. But uh, one question that I had for you, are you doing anything in terms of, so most of the design projects that I see now involve like um, uh, biomass, they involve uh, uh, recycling of plastics, they involve, you know, like solids. So I have started to thinking that I should increase my focus on solids handling and uh, non-conventional solids, solids like filtering, crystallization, uh, you know, and this type of drying and all the stuff. Are you are you doing anything in that area? I will be honest. It's a fluids focus course. The book has a chapter on solids handling specifically, um, but it's just very introductory. So in my course, no. Um, and a big part of that is because my expertise is in fluids, not in solids, and that's just yeah. that's just the that's just my personal limitation. Um, so yeah, I'm not. Yeah, because right now I'm doing the. Uh, uh, recycling of plastics by dissolution and you know let's say you take polypropylene or polyethylene and how you want to model that so how do you want to model a filter you know to uh you know let's say with a solvent like toluene or isopropanol or something like this so how to do that in aspen and most of the projects now they involve this kind of components they're not you know standard conventional fluids at least uh yeah Looks like That's Michael going to be de dependent on your comment, own expertise, or, uh, I think. Mario, you had a comment as well? Uh, yeah, but I wasn't interrupting. I was just raising my hand. That's all. <laughs> okay. We have just a couple uh, more minutes left. Let me, this is an excellent discussion. I wanted to get to just a couple additional questions if possible. Um, if, and Mario, did you have a comment as well? You want I to make did, because unfortunately I have to run for another meeting. I just uh, wanted to congratulate Tom again on the Himmelblau Award, you know, very richly deserved. And, uh, you know, again, congratulations on all your, your wonderful work. And thanks for giving this webinar. Thanks, Mario. Thanks, Mario. Okay. Uh, just two quick questions. I know we're about out of time here. Um, you know, you showed the other courses that are taught and kind of this flow of curriculum and you have so many PSC faculty there at McMaster, any efforts to coordinate curriculum between the classes being taken in parallel, such as using examples being taught in other courses and revisiting those to go into more depth. Um, it, it just, 
wondering if this would be helpful with retention of information. Um, well, in terms of like classes in parallel and prereq, uh, the structure is very rigid for us. So like we know what's being taught in order for the most part, um, not always. But um, what is happening is that we started moving some of the chapters, like the tutorials into earlier years. So I know that they're doing those um, in other courses, so I don't have to do them in mine. Um, as far as particular examples, what is happening is some of the earlier professors are sending me their exams or their particular questions. And then I could say, no, we did, you did this here, let's talk about it again. Um, but it is not a lot in that sense of coordinating a cross curriculum specific example. So that is unfortunately, no, we do not do that. Um, it's a very good, it's a very interesting idea. I don't know if we can pull it off because the, the, the teaching changes, whoever teaches every single term, it tends to bounce around um, quite a bit. Okay. One final question. Do you use the simulator only for city state simulations or also for dynamic simulation with the aim of taking into account process control design? Uh, okay, so at third year, we do not look at integrated control and design. They're just learning control at the same time, and we do steady state only. Um, they do actually dynamics earlier in the modeling in a general sense. Uh, it might be just like a leaky tank or something. Um, in the fourth year, they can do the control-oriented design, and that's going to be very project-specific, but not in the third year. Okay, one final question. Um, this is excellent material for using Aspen. For somebody who teaches with another tool, like maybe a Viva or DW Sim or CamCAD, some of these other simulators, what is the ability to adapt some of this content to other courses that use other tools? So Cash Corporation, who partially funded this book, um, is interested in having the book translated into other programs um, because the structure of the book and the nature of the things that could be like almost word for word replicated with different screen captures in many, many cases with some of the competing products. Um, I don't have another book to offer. Um, I think the structure would be the same and the ideas are the same. Um, but uh, I do know that several professors have switched to Aspen Plus only because the book is available, not because they necessarily wanted to use Aspen Plus. Um, it would be better if they actually had a different book in their chosen program. Okay. Very good. Well, I think we're about out of time. I had another comment. Congratulations on the award, Professor Adam Adams. Uh, Well-deserved. Nice talk as well. And I think I'll just echo that comment as well as from uh, Mario on congratulations on the award. And we're really glad that you gave this presentation today. Very informative uh, to give some insights on how you teach and uh, some of your contributions with the book and uh, and uh, some of your observations in, in bringing that into the classroom. So thank you so much for the presentation. Thanks a lot, John, and everybody for coming. Okay, thanks everybody.